Hi, I'm Heather Marie Montilla, and you are watching PBS Books. Welcome. PBS Books this evening is pleased to present in partnership with Poetry in America and the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, a special program to honor Robert Frost during his birthday week. Frost was born on March 26, 1874. So this week marks his 148th birthday. We're celebrating with two trailblazers, poet Tracy K. Smith and founder of Poetry in America, Alisa New. This is really perfect for all of us because it's Women's History Month. So we're able to talk about a canonical, an amazing American poet with two amazing women. So glad you could, could be with us and thank you for joining. Poetry in America draws students of all ages in conversations to talk about poetry. They present episodes that offer viewers a full immersive experience in hearing, reading, and interpreting a single American poem. Athletes, poets, politicians, music, mu musicians, architects, scientists, entrepreneurs, and more join together with host and Harvard prof professor Elisa New to experience and share the power of poetry. Let's watch a trailer. This poem literally makes me go back into my past. The first two lines, I mean, what kind of hook is that? When we put it in our heads, we're in the fastest roller coaster we've ever been on. If this was the only poem you had ever read, what would you think poems do? And what would you think poems are for? So Poetry in America actually began airing in January on PBS channels across the country, and it's still airing on many stations through the spring. To see them, in case you missed many of the series, and they're amazing, there's eight of them, there are eight half an hour um, episodes, you can go to either pbs.org or you can go to poetryinamerica.org, but don't forget to check them out. So this evening we are delving into Robert Frost's poem, Mending Wall. Do good fences really make good neighbors? Well, this is a poem that is quoted so much throughout everyday life in America and in tons of TV shows, movies, etc. Today's guests will ask surprising questions about the role of walls in society. So before we begin, I know many of you know, I like to thank all of you for being here, but most importantly also, I like to thank our library partners, 1800 Strong, as well as numerous PBS stations across the country who share this important content with all of you. But we couldn't do it if you weren't here with us, so thank you for joining us. So the moment you've been waiting for, I always like to introduce the poet first because, well, She's a Pulitzer Prize winner. She's amazing. Um, she's also a former poet laureate. Tracy K. Smith is our featured guest tonight. She is Pul Pulitzer Prize winning poet, memorist, translator. She has also served as the poet laureate of the United States from 2017 to 2019. Her most recent book is Such Color, New and Selected Poems. She teaches at Harvard University. Welcome, Tracy. Thank you. Great Thank you so you. much for joining us. I can't wait to jump into the conversation with you in a minute. <laughs> so to guide today's conversation and to help us go through the Robert Frost poem, we are so lucky to have Elisa New. Elisa is the director and host of Poetry in America. She is the director of the center of Public Humanities for Arizona State University, Director of Verse Video Education, and the Powell M. Cabot Professor of American Literature at Harvard University. She created Poetry in America, a PBS series to bring poetry into living rooms and onto screens of all kinds. The show, as we discussed, 
can be seen on television and it can be streamed on many platforms, not only in your home, in libraries, in schools, and even on airlines. Without further ado, welcome, Elisa. Thank you. Thank you so much, Heather. It's wonderful to be with you again, it really is. And I love the idea that we're reaching so many librarians. Hello, American libraries. Love you. <laughs> well, we are so glad to partner with you. And you are no stranger to PBS Books. This is probably your third, fourth, maybe your fourth program with us. So before we begin, the things I've been wondering, and I know our audience has been wondering too, how, what is your creative process? How do you pick the poem? Do you pick the poet first? Do you just pick the poem? Do you pick the poet and then drill down and find the right poem? How do you do it? Um, that's a really great question, Heather. And um, in, in the first season of Poetry in America, and of course we thought there would only be one season, I thought about how can I pick 12 poems that will somehow represent the greatness of American poetry. And I didn't know that I would have to, that I would have the privilege of, of continuing to do this. Now that I have that privilege, I think in so many different directions at once. If there's someone extraordinary like Tracy, uh, whom I can tempt uh, on screen, I think about what Tracy might enjoy reading and uh, of another poet's work and what she might uh, eventually enjoy reading with me of her own. Tracy is doing a, an episode with us next, uh, next season uh, about a poem of hers. But sometimes as with President Biden, uh, whom I filmed for an episode, um, I, I actually, I, I had President Biden and I knew what I wanted him to read. And I asked him, I said, I've got a great poem for you. And he consented. Others, um, I happened to get lucky enough to uh, uh, have Bono talk about poetry with me. And he was adamant that he wanted to talk about two poems by Allen Ginsberg. It was those poems and only those poems. And so that's what we did. But really now as I, and I'll wrap up my answer with this, as we plan a season of Poetry in America, and now we're, we're in the middle of making season four, even as season three is, is airing this spring, we think about how the full diversity, how can we uh, include a poet from a region that you might not have known about much about. Let's make sure we include a poet from before the 20th century. Let's make sure all the communities and all the voices that um, have contributed to, uh, to America are represented. Let's, let's look for some guests who are um, venerable and wise, and let's look for some guests who are young. And so I guess it's in, in many ways, Heather, it's the element of surprise. Um, <laughs> our, our series is an anthology series, and we want viewers to have the experience of saying always, oh, I knew poetry was that from last week, but I didn't know it could be this. And so it's um, trying to mix it up and you won't be surprised that people love sitting around my kitchen dreaming up who, whom we should ask. Bob Dylan is a frequent suggestion as if I hadn't thought of that myself, um, but that gives you uh, the flavor. No, and, and that's perfect. I mean, I feel like you have rock star guests, you know, yes, rock star, but also just so many famous people who everyday Americans can relate to. And that brings this element of surprise. Um, and so for those of you out there who have not yet tuned into Poetry in America, you will be surprised. You will be thrilled when you see, you know, hey, this poem, oh my gosh, this Caroline Kennedy likes this poem or my favorite author, Julia Alvar, right? That's what's so neat is that every episode has like gifts, like nuggets, like little gifts waiting for the viewer. And then 
you squeeze it into half an hour. And so it's, it's amazing because it's per, like a great length too. So kudos to you and your team at Poetry Thank in America. So it's, it's just such a, a treat yes. for us to have you. It's so much fun. Um, and so to make it's, it's so wonderful to get to know a little bit more. So now to the reason we're here and to getting to, to Tracy K. Smith on, on, the, on the feed, I'm going to throw it to a clip so we can see what is this episode actually about and with Robert Frost. So let, let's take a look. Something there is that doesn't love a wall. Something there is that doesn't love a wall. Something there is that doesn't love a wall. That sends the frozen ground swell under it and spills the upper boulders in the sun. It makes gaps even two can pass abreast. A word like something, as the first word of this poem, is a huge choice. It initially feels arbitrary. That's what really gets you started in wanting to follow him. You're immediately in the countryside and you're trying to figure out, well, what is he talking about? And is it winter and is it the cold or the frost? If you are not native to a place, native folkways are something that bar you from really full integration. There's a part of this poem that I believe is about eliminating different barriers to belonging. Frost might seem to be arguing that all walls should come down. So why does he call his neighbor and ask him to come mend fences? I think it's because he understands that we cannot do away with all of the fences, that we have to be very careful in choosing which fences to take down and which fences to leave up. When does a ritual and tradition become gated and keep us apart? And when does it energize and keep us together, keep us civil in a civil society? Well, Thank you. that was a great clip. And I'm going to throw it over to Alisa to jump into the conversation. That, what that clip does is sort of a flyover of, of many of the themes that we touch on in a poem that can seem so simple as to be, um, you know, not worth pausing over. It's a, and it's a poem, this poem, Mending Wall, is one many of us think we know. Um, we've, we've heard it, we've certainly heard key lines from it. Um, what I'd love to begin by asking Tracy is something more specific, and that is about your relationship to Robert Frost. Um, you consented to read, you know, to, to do this show, and there are many poets who, uh, whom I'm, I'm sure have influenced you, but you, you must have made a connection uh, to him somewhere. And of course, whenever I invite people to be on the show, that's important, yeah. some sort of connection. So when did you make yours? I must have read Frost in high school, but I felt like I really read him for the first time when I was a student at Harvard um, in the 90s, taking poetry workshops. And um, I remember reading his poem, Directive, and walking to campus with this poem in my head and make, having it match my footfalls and also somehow having it match my own like quandaries, you know, that poem begins back out of all this now too much for us. Um, that's the first line. And the sentence continues to back in a time made simple by the loss. And so back is, is a, a, a way of orienting us within time. But that first line back out of all this now too much for us is a unit of meaning that was so useful to me. Um, there are some things that you can walk away from. There are some things that are too hard. There are some things um, that you can say no to. And the rhythm of the poem, the images of the poem were instructive to me as a poet, but 
phrases like that were really helpful to me as a human, as a young human struggling with so many questions and, and you know, dilemmas. Um, you know, that, that first line is, it's not easy. It's not easy in the way something there is that doesn't love yeah. a wall isn't easy. And it, we could talk about the ways it isn't easy. One way, as I was listening to you, that I was thinking about is that it, that, that it takes us back into some primeval place, something original, something that came before us that may speak to our present dilemmas, the dilemma of a, of a Harvard student walking to campus, but, but is other. Yeah. And um, yes. you and I once spoke a, another time about this poem and you told me about a walk in the woods you took. Mm -hmm. I was just gonna say, Frost is so great at guiding you into a poem with this sense of expectation and a sense of mystery. And then having you cross the threshold into the poem and, and realize that you're not, you're not in control and you have to pay really um, earnest attention to, um, to orient yourself. And this poem, you know, does that. Uh, what I think we were talking about was a, my first visit to Vermont many years ago um, to Breadloaf. And I was with uh, the poet Camille T. Dungy, who's a friend, and she said, do you want to take a walk in the woods? And I said, oh, yes, of course. It's so beautiful. I'd love to. And so we crossed a field and we stepped into this grove of trees. And all of a sudden, you know, we, we were in a different space. Light changed, sound changed. I could hear almost the buzzing of life and agency in, in this, you know, like forest. And I felt afraid. I knew it was beautiful and I knew we were safe, but I knew that there was something larger than us. That was- Something uh, there is that doesn't love. Yeah, that, that something, right? And yeah, that first little glimmer of fear it kind of takes me into something there is that doesn't love. Oh, wait, I'm not in control. Maybe am I even safe here? Um, and so there's this trepidation. And, you know, of course, there are lots of other things that the poem does as it unfolds. But one of them is to say, isn't it really amazing to realize that the places we know, we don't really know. Let's think about that. Yeah. And that they might be built on something fairly insubstantial, um, or out of, or they might be constructed, which is a, a word that applies to walls over um, uncertainty. Mm -hmm. under, under when when you say fear, I wonder about, and maybe this would be a great moment actually to ask you to read part of the poem. Okay. Would you would you read um, part of Mending Wall to us? Sure, I'll, I'll skip down toward the bottom. Um, because there is something else that comes in that brings me to that, that sense of awe um, and mystery. Something there is that doesn't love a wall that wants it down. I could say elves to him, but it's not elves exactly. And I'd rather he said it for himself. I see him there bringing a stone grasped firmly by the top in each hand, like an old stone, savage armed. He moves in darkness as it seems to me, not of woods only in the shade of trees. He will not go behind his father's saying, and he likes having thought of it so well, he says again, good fences make good neighbors. Those are the last lines of the poem. And I feel like it's an interesting um, back and forth that we engage in, even on our way out of the poem, between what's pat, what's familiar, what we can handle, and also something that it's hard to confront, um, something that um, might undo us if we really kind of gave ourselves over to thinking and acknowledging it. Um, and maybe that's a bargain that runs through this poem that is also a big part of the subject. And let's let's go after that a little bit. There, you know, you had first said fear. You know, there's and and that theme of the fearsome certainly mm -hmm. returns at the end of the poem. And it's hard to know what to be more afraid of: things that are pat or things that carry stones. You know, <laughs> are and how those. I, I, I'm probably leading you too far because I'm I'm confused about 
I'm still, after reading this poem for this many years and making a television episode about it, <laughs> it's not what resolved. it means for human beings to be fear are afraid of and what it is that makes us build walls. Maybe that's for better and worse. Well, you know, I, I read this poem as productive in making us ask that very question. It's got some inklings, you know, something that might give us a sense of possible answers that Frost might have, you know, been conscious of. But whenever I read a poem and there are possibilities that are activated for me, that feels um, more valid sometimes than saying, well, which possibility is the one that I'm supposed to come away with? Um, and so I like thinking there's a part of um, decorum that's terrifying, <laughs> that's controlling and flattening. There is a part of freedom that feels like it, it it's also fearsome. Um, there's something large and dark around us and there's something large and dark within us. Um, and in a way, if I tear down the walls in the poem, I just get to dwell with all of those, all of those um, possibilities. And so it's unsettling. Um, but there's also something consoling about the music of the poem that allows me to move steadily um, and in a way familiarly because that rhythm, that meter gets into you. It actually mimics you, your heart. Um, and so I feel, I feel emboldened somehow and it's it's natural and of your body and so mm -hmm. sort of primeval and at the same time it's measured and mm -hmm. <laughs> right it it provides you a structure in which to dwell and that tension and that um or that synthesis or pairing of yes this rhythm is wild enough to be organic <laughs> yes this poem honors our wildness and at the same time it knows that we want to put one foot in front of another <laughs> and and know where we've gotten to and be able to say something about where we've we've gotten to that may be a, a can, little abstract sure please so as someone who right i have not studied poetry my whole life and i'm not a, a poet laureate how do you, and, and I don't want to take us back because we're so far, but I want the audience, this, this poem is a great starting place and Frost is a great starting place because so much of his work seems familiar. So as someone who, you know, Frost is, everyone grows up with Frost in some way, even, even today. So as we approach this poem, which is also a great poem, not only because the subject matter and, 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 and that familiarness, but how would someone start? How does someone start to really understand? Is it line by line? Is it, is it um, you know, read a few and think about it? How do they start to be able to feel and get to where you are? Because, I mean, what you're talking about is magic, <laughs> you know, but, I, but how does someone else find their way there? Um, and then, and, and we can't, That's right? That's believe in magic. That's Heather. <laughs> The poems are spells and they they are incantations and and frost in which we we must believe that they know what they're about. Um, it is that that's the beginning. I, I I'm just riffing on you saying magic, but I think in some way people think, well, I, I need a crowbar to get into this poem mm -hmm. instead of I need to be enchanted mm -hmm. but are you i'm sure you have um more to say than, well, than i agree with you i also feel that we have a lot of knowledge and instinct that can get us quite far in any poem um i i spent a lot of time you know traveling in the laureate ship and i, I wanted to go into communities where there wasn't necessarily a lot of consistent literary programming and so we would read poems by po other poets and I would say, okay, you don't need a specialized vocabulary to um, experience and even talk about this poem. So I would read it, someone else would read it. So we'd have another voice in the room 
um, inevitably calling our attention to different details of the poem. And then I, I ask people, what do you notice? You know, what is what do you see in this poem? What do you hear? What what comes to mind um, associatively based on what happens in the poem? What memories are activated for you by the poem? All of that becomes a way of making or gathering. Um, you know, I almost don't like the word sense because it it sort of underlines the notion that there's an answer to a poem that you can get. But if you think about the different forms of sense that we live with, some of them are logic based, but many of them have to do with feeling or sound or energy or um, all of that is incredibly useful to moving through a poem. And maybe you have to read it more than once. And it's amazing if you can be in a space where you can talk to other people because they're the things they notice can, you know, trip off other discoveries for you about what's right in front of you. Yeah, I do. And I, I think in some ways what Tracy has just described is the concept that mm -hmm. undergirds yeah. this television series, which has, I, I, I don't know whether I want to go as far to say it has this it, it doesn't believe in solitary reading. I do believe, I, I, I still think there's a place for solitary reading, but, but human language is social. <laughs> and there's something very natural about the way we can lift a poet. We, we, we together are really better at reading a text that after all is addressed to many people. Um, even though the technology of a page that sits in front of one person tells us that we should be reading um, alone. I I know that um, we asked Tracy to bring a poem and um, that poem goes to what I think is one of the most profound uh, themes in, in Frost's Mending Wall and a theme that really speaks to our time. And, and that has to do with um, how do we build a society <laughs> where we we can live together. What kinds of walls are helpful to us, and what kinds of walls um, work against our collective interests? How do how do we determine? Um, and so, would it, Heather, be an appropriate moment to? What I thought I could do is remind everyone where we are. So I'm Heather Marie Montia. You're here with PBS yes. Books. And we are so lucky here to have today um, Elisa New from Poetry in America and Tracy K. Smith, um, esteemed poet, uh, former poet laureate and Pulitzer Prize winning poet. So we're so happy to have all of you here and to continue the conversation. Over to Tracy. And I can, Tracy, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to give you a little more uh, of a ramp. Okay. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> okay. There's something there is that doesn't mind a ramp. <laughs> it's, 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 so um, Robert Frost, Robert Frost's poem, Mending Wall, which has the word, you know, it's an odd phrase, Mending Wall, um, has at at the center of it, a, a ritual that two neighbors participate in where they mend a wall together. And um, just what is accomplished by the, that is mend an old New England wall that has fallen apart because of storms and the weather. They, they put it back to rights. And that, that, um, Rituals, the word, but that repeated seasonal rebuilding of the wall is at the center of this poem. And I'd, I'd love to ask you to just reflect on that as it speaks to um, the society maybe in which we now live and at what appropriate moment you choose <laughs> to read your poem uh, that you brought um uh, that you chose, that you, uh, and I certainly agree, think speaks to uh, these questions and maybe maybe speaks back to Robert Frost a little bit or adds to, enriches the conversation. Well, I really love that you use the word ritual in describing what happens in Frost's poem. 
um, because I feel like ritual is a space where we come together and we come out of ourselves, out of our habitual selves. We don't have a whole lot of um, like national rituals anymore. I don't know, maybe we never did, but it seems like um, the one of the aims of that practice is to reconfigure the distance that we guard between, you know, other people, between our true selves, maybe also between that something at the beginning of Froth's poem, the lot, I, I think of it as like the largeness or the, you know, the presence that um, maybe contains our human presence. Um, I think about ritual a lot right now because, you know, we're still in the throes of so many different kinds of upheaval. We live with war. We live with violence uh, as an everyday fact of, of civic life. Um, we live with a great deal of uncertainty. And um, I think that we're, we're, we're fraught, you know, we're, we're um, in need of something that could right our our psychic and even maybe like biological rhythms, our social rhythms. Um, and maybe what, what's so interesting about thinking about Frost poem as a, as a site of ritual is the wall is designed to um, keep an orderly um, distance between, you know, one person's life and another's. Um, it's designed to ensure, you know, intact privacy. It's designed to in ensure perhaps a kind of safety. Um, it, it means you can be out of sight, out of mind. Um, if, if I just have a high enough wall, um, and I think there can be harm in, in attending chiefly to those kinds of goals and aims. Um, in my poem, um, which is called The United States Welcomes You, um, I'm thinking about distance as a site of fear, mistrust, um, and, and assumptions. And, you know, the, the title of the poem makes me think of immigration. And so there's the big border wall that comes to mind. But I'll be honest and say that when I wrote the poem, I was thinking about violence against unarmed Black citizens. And I was thinking about the way that the gaze, the, the policing gaze, but in some ways the American imagination looks at others um, with built-in suspicion. Um, it took me a little while to figure out what I wanted to call the poem. And because I'm so concerned with the American imagination, I chose the title that I did. The United States welcomes you. Why and by whose power were you sent? What do you see that you may wish to steal? Why this dancing? Why do your dark bodies drink up all the light? What are you demanding that we feel? Have you stolen something? Then what is that leaping in your chest? What is the nature of your mission? Do you seek to offer a confession? Have you anything to do with others brought by us to harm? Then why are you afraid? And why do you invade our night? Hands raised, eyes wide, mute as ghosts. Is there something you wish to confess? Is this some enigmatic type of test? What if we fail? How and to whom do we address our appeal? Reading this with frost in my ear, you know, and on my mind, I hear that, you know, th there is this moving back and forth across a line in this poem. It begins with a very confident or even, you know, arrogant kind of um, set of questions, right? Why are you here? What do you, what do you want to take? But then there are moments where some vulnerability creeps in on the part of the interrogator. So, you know, what are you demanding that we feel? Seems like a moment where um, the questioner goes to a di different place, at least acknowledging a certain kind of susceptibility that's um, frightening, perhaps. Um, the end of the poem, I, I, I hope, goes to that place as well. You know, is this some kind of test? What if we fail? What if we're, we're wrong to be doing what we do as we do it? Um, and so in a way, it makes me think that the wall, one 
purpose of the wall, maybe in Frost's poem, is to undergird the certainty. This is where I am. This is what I want to be in. And this is what I want to be out. But there's a part of the imagination, even one that cleaves to that kind of certainty that says, I think there's something more I must be accountable for. <laughs> and two, um, a wall can help push that that sense of accountability away. And your, your devastating poem, as I, I've been reading it over the last few days, um, you know, it's very monologic. It starts, or it starts as an interrogation and you, one doesn't hear, you know, there's nothing I vow. There is an object subjected, another person, but a person made object subjected to um, in, inquisi you know, inquiry and inquisition. And there are those moments when the other person becomes present in the poem speaks back within the consciousness what you know what are you trying to make us feel is a way of saying i am feeling something mm -hmm. and to whom and to whom what if we fail and to whom there is some accountability mm -hmm. that one hears there and i i think that for me one of the first ways that this poem really powerfully sends me back to Frost asking, did he see that? Did he not see that? It is that the importance of a dialogue of there being two sides, <laughs> right? A, a wall is also a place with that has two sides that people might, that they have to come together to build in a kind of dialogue or, or some kind of consent, some relationship. If you don't show up, we're not building the wall together. And that there is a, um, th there's a kind of structural imperative to there being two mm -hmm. in a, in a working society. And I think what your poem does is it says, we do not yet have that dialogue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and those those who are administering the questions don't even know yet, mm -hmm. but please. Yeah, I, you know, it's funny because I, I didn't have this framework in mind. I didn't have like all of the things we just talked about in mind when I started writing the poem. Um, and it began as a series of questions. In fact, first it began written from the opposite voice. And I felt that I was moving too close toward just trying to protect that person, that subject. Um, and so I inverted the gaze and it wasn't automatic that those, those vulnerable questions came, didn't come in automatically. And I didn't even notice them at first when they did. Um, but I noticed them as I was trying to figure out how to exit the poem. And I went back and I read and I said, okay, um, there, there's this dual kind of consciousness. And mm -hmm. I wonder if, um, you know, a big part of this poem for me was thinking, okay, I get it. There are assumptions, but there's also a notion that there is another way to see. There is another site of responsibility and it emerges from the interrogator. That was really kind of yeah. interesting and, and exciting to me. Like there is a turn that's possible within this dynamic. There's... And there's a personal sort of redemption with, you know, whoever this interrogator is, one feels not, not full redemption, but a hint that this person is being made, is being made to feel, um, is, um, uh, recognizes the possibility of failure of his own, his own, their own failure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it might be a, a, a realization that could stick, but we also live in a world where we know it's easy to bat all of that away and say, yeah. That, you know. Yeah, yeah. And that, and it's so that the reciprocity and the confidence that Robert Frost has, that if two guys just meet at a wall <laughs> um, and one accepts tradition or rich or, you know, so let's go back for a second. How, how can ritual... Had we 
developed as a society, the United States developed as a society, more rituals of wall building between communities, um, we, we might have a place to go. I mean, this is a, this is, this is a customs booth. This is a, <laughs> or mm -hmm. something even yeah. more malignant here. That it, this is, a, this is a, 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 we're at a border here, mm -hmm. which is different from a constructive. Yeah. Place. I mean, I would even say, let's say, let's, let's stop short of saying wall building ritual <laughs> and okay. just say, what, what can ritual do? Yeah. Um, I believe it disrupts the habitual rhythms that help us to bat away at the, the complexity and even our own sense of um, being implicated in unrest and pro uh, imbalance and problems, right? So a ritual says we're going to move through space. We're going to be mindful of something other than linear logic. Um, that other thing, however we invoke it, is going to be large and we're going to recognize the actual scale of our, our lives, which is small in the mm -hmm. face of that large thing. And, um, you know, there are lots of things that can come in. I think about a ritual like the ring shout, which lives in African-American tradition and, you know, extends from um, West African um, traditions of praise and communal gathering and percussion, um, the spirit catches you and it can bring consolation. It can bring a momentary, momentary realization that you exist not just in this difficult moment, but all of time. And what does that give you re recourse or access to? Um, strength from those who came before, you know, need and belief from those who will come after. Um, and the words, the words of these spirituals that live in the ring shout have meaning that extends in various directions. One is toward, you know, deliverance and hope. And another is toward a very subversive kind of resistance to oppression. Yeah. Um, all of those things um, are power, make powerful. They impart power um, and hope. And so what, what would the ritual look like that could bring people together who occupy different positions on the spectrum of power and oppressed? And um, what, what is this large? I mean, in, in some ways, Frost's poem is premised on the civic equality of neighbors. Mm -hmm. And so what do, what is a ritual for and how does it, and how can it, um, and how can it work for us? I do want to point out in um, that you were almost reciting the last line of directive. You said a momentary stay. Oh, did I really? <laughs> well, there you yes. go. Frost is in there. You were describing the poem you described, directive, which begins with being very confused and ends with finding a cup and drinking some water. Uh, it's a ritual moment, and um, yeah. and it's a ritual moment where the the water is dipped from the past, from the well of the past, and you know the role of the past in all of this. The our American past. It's hard to find the place to to lower the dipper um, uh, between communities mm -hmm. um, unequal so long with such distinctions of power. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's another thing that can happen, right? The disruption of these hierarchies, which we believe are natural, uh, a ritual can be leveling and say, <laughs> actually, all this stuff you thought was important and propping some other some up and other keeping others down. It's false. It's imaginary. Let's get right. into space where we can acknowledge that. Maybe and Mardi Gras does <laughs> some of that. I'm 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 actually mm -hmm. beginning to think here about where are the places. It's hard because there's so many things that begin and exist for many people as earnest and and um, with a direct line to this other thing that have become commodified and, you know, filled with tourism and made into spectacle and entertainment. So the participation isn't the same. But right. I think that there is um, I think there's a lot. I see so much ritual. Um, even you talk about these two frost poems as enacting rituals, poetry 
is something that I think brings us to that place very um, naturally. And um, I think there are other vocab artistic vocabularies for that kind of um, mm -hmm. reorienting. Mm -hmm. Public, great public works of art, the architecture of, you know, you think of some of the great monuments as opposed to the tawdry and shameful mm -hmm. monuments, some of the great monuments um, of in our society. I think there are a lot of questions that are suddenly um, <laughs> erupting <laughs> in the chat. Uh, Heather, should we um, begin to address these? Yes, thank you for <laughs> inviting me back. So You're we have a question from Ron on Facebook and it's for Tracy and it says, who do you envision as the receiver or answerer of the questions you ask? Or do you need a focal point for the questions? Well, I was writing with a familiar dynamic in mind. You know, there's a moment where this person you know, says, why you're always there, hands up, eyes wide, mute as ghosts. I was thinking of an interrogation, somebody being apprehended by a police officer. That's where my vocabulary um, sort of took root. But I don't think that excludes certain other exchanges, um, especially when we get into the weeds of those questions that ask us to think, who's who else is watching? You know, then we could take that 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 dynamic into almost any context where um, one person's perspective can be like a cage for for another person. Great. There is I'm, another question. I'm, Go ahead. I, I, I'm sorry, over I am absorbing that question, and I think um, I, if I'd like to do a follow up before the the next yes, one, yes. if I could, because I I think when you've you've helped us think about how what Matt what might pretend to be dialogue <laughs> or innocent inquiry. Um, is a cage and and where exchange of language can um, be incarcerating uh, in that way so that the self arrested in that horrible frozen posture wouldn't know how to answer, um, would be transformed or frozen by, by that language. And because you know, we, we began with Frost, who believes in dialogue, who believes we can kind of sort it, sort it through. There may be too much romanticism about, a little bit too much romanticism about language and about exchange of language um, that um, poems like yours help to, um, help to correct. Heather, That's a great I just couldn't no. let that one. No, it's so good. I love that interpretation and 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 sharing those insights. Thank you. Thank you so much. A, a great translation for us. Um, Diana from Facebook has an, has another question for Tracy, and she wrote, "I often think about your great poem declaration and wonder if you could talk about any relationships between erasure, poetry, and mending wall, or taking." Uh, down walls. Thank you. Well, I feel like your question gives us a lot. <laughs> um, I think your question is a really good argument in a way or a reminder for thinking about um, thinking about looking at um, looking at the barriers that can exist within documents that we see, to, you know, or language that we see as intact and, and infallible, which is how we describe a lot of the founding documents um, in this country. Um, erasure poetry, where you go through and you redact a, a text, um, allows you to hear a, a counterpoint, another point of view within, within this familiar body of, 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 of insight or expression. Um, when I looked at the Declaration of Independence and, and started whittling away at some, some of the language, I heard almost a parallel grievance that was rooted in the, the story of Black life in, in America um, that I hadn't set out to find, but that felt extremely compelling once I did find it. Um, 
I think of erasure in some ways as an opportunity to take away that which has served to silence or, um, you know, invalidate um, non-central perspectives, you know, um, the way that, that certain lives, certain voices are erased by, you know, by a culture that says, you know, it's not, you're not valid, you're not um, central, you're not familiar. Um, an erasure might, might allow us to go back and hear what has been um, muted out. Is, I'm not seeing a, a question, but I have one. Uh, <laughs> is is yes. there acknowledgement in Frost's poem of those voices or is there is there language there that um we might not erase but we might um struggle with in it and um in, and interrogate um in the in that poem i i've i think been kind of thinking with you about what frost saw um, he was certainly a person, although he didn't grow up rich, he was certainly a person of privilege in, in many ways, lived in a, um, you know, in New England, in a region um, that had prestige, had a sort of American prestige that he identified with, even though he was from California, really, like you, he's kind of self-made. So I'm, I'm wondering, um, it sounds like Frost has been an important poet for you, um, but, you know, where you... Where do you think? Is he, is he with you? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, <laughs> I like you. I, I really think a lot about the self-made aspect of Frost, which means what did he buy into as mm -hmm. valid and as, you know, aspirational. And um, I think it was a source of power, you know, that doesn't negate the power of his poetry, but the dynamic, of equals in this poem is a dynamic of landowners or, you know, adjacent, adjacent landowners. I don't know that he owned that land, but, um, and, um, an assumption of, you know, inviolable, uh, belonging. Yeah. And, um, I even hear, you know, in his inaugural poem. <laughs> oh, for sure. Yeah. This, um, something that, that I can't quite, even as much as I trust the, you know, music of his lines and the integrity of, of his images, I can't quite accept that the land was ours before we were the lands, imagining an ours that, that feels um, white, that <laughs> feels powerful. Um, so yeah, there, there are, <laughs> there are borders I will, I will yeah. kind of keep there between me and a wholehearted uh, agreement with Frost's worldview. Yeah, and we don't have to um, love every worldview, you know, every last bit of a poet's worldview. Yeah. I mean, that poem is an erasure, as I see it, of an indig indigenous presence. Yes. The validation of that which sought to erase. So, yeah. 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 Um, and it's, he, he, he had intended another poem, but that's mm -hmm. the one that came to mind. Heather, you might want, I think there's another question and I, I think we, we are getting near the end. We'll back we to you. Time, which is so hard because the last question, and it was from Pamela, it does talk about, and I quickly, if you have any thoughts, it's something that I thought of, which is despite the fact that this was written not yesterday, it feels, Frost poem feel like they were written yesterday. They're timeless. Um, and you know, as we're closing this program, I know you probably both could speak for a long time about those thoughts, but is there any quick, why do we feel that way? When, why, why do we feel that his work is so timeless? Well, quickly I'll say, and then I want to hear from Lisa. Um, he writes in uh, a familiar lexicon, a conversational lexicon, his blank verse, which is you know, a real formal structure is invisible in many ways. There's a lot of internal rhyme, but we don't have the artifice um, in our face that, that end rhyme um, brings. And so there's a way that it almost sounds like there's someone talking to you when you read, when you read a Frost poem. And that is, that is his real genius, that he, he discovered an American vernacular, um, the, the real kind of 
form, the architecture, that, which is the wrong word because it's softer than that. But he, he discovered how American talk sounds and the poetry of American talk. And we do still talk that way. Um, <laughs> we or, or even if we talk differently, there's, and you know, the, the English, English talks that way. Um, American English talks that way or talks in a way close enough that um, that it it feels like we just heard it. Well, this has been an incredible conversation. Thank you so much, um, Alisa. Th thank you for bringing Tracy here. Thank you for both of you, for your creativity, for um, I will say, Tracy, it was such a treat to hear you read not one but two poems um, and for sharing your artistry with us. And um, so thank you so much for joining us. And Alisa New, thank you for creating Poetry in America and, and letting us know there's a season four so we can uh, continue our planning and doing more programs. Um, this has just been an incredible conversation. Um, and so we hope everyone will tune in to Poetry in America. Once again, go to pbs.org or poetryinamerica.org. Um, I'm Heather Marie Montilla. I'm with PBS Books. We will be here next Wednesday at 5 p.m. speaking to a, ch a children's author, um, Jane Yolen, about her book about Ben Franklin and the Circulating Library. Uh, ben Franklin is actually coming out um, Ken Burns' Ben Franklin is, is starting to air on April 4th, and it is two two-hour segments, so don't miss that as well. Um, I Once again, we love when you join us, and we hope to see you again soon. And until next time, happy reading. <laughs>